Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff. Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to be discussing the biomechanics of cervical flexion and extension. We're going to begin by talking about cervical flexion, which is exactly what you see here in this picture. This individual is bending their neck forward as if to nod their head yes. So that's cervical flexion. Now, there's several important things that happen anatomically during cervical flexion. That's what we're going to talk about first. So over here, we have a blown up version of the cervical spine. So up here, this is C1, the atlas. Remember the atlas does not have a spinous process. It actually just has a posterior tubercle. The spinous processes start at C2. Okay? Uh, remember that there is a broad ligament-like structure that connects all the spinous processes down to C7. That's the nuchal ligament, also called ligamentum nuchae in Latin. So whenever you go into cervical flexion, Notice that the spinous processes, including the C1 posterior tubercle, they all separate. So when we look at the neck here, the anterior surface actually gets smaller and the posterior surface actually gets larger, which makes sense because we're bending the neck forward. More space posteriorly, less space anteriorly. So that means posteriorly, these spinous processes and the posterior tubercle are all going to separate from one another. They're going to separate. That also means that any ligament posteriorly, including this ligament nuchae, is actually going to be put on tension. So when you go into cervical flexion, the ligament nuchae is put in tension. And actually, part of the restriction of cervical flexion is actually the ligament nuchae, although there's a lot of other structures involved as well. I also mentioned that the anterior surface here actually has a smaller length now in cervical flexion. And so that means that this anterior longitudinal ligament is going to be put on laxity now. Okay. It has some laxity in it. Now, if we think about the discs in between these vertebrae, uh, remember that uh, the outer rim of it is the annulus fibrosus. And so whenever we go into cervical flexion, it puts a little more pressure on the disc anteriorly. And so anteriorly speaking, this annulus fibrosus gets compressed a little bit during cervical flexion. Again, it's not a pathological compression. It's just more compressed than it would be posteriorly. So hopefully that makes sense. All right, we can also talk about the zygopophyseal or facet joints as they're often called. Remember we have a facet joint on each side at each level. That means we have two at each level, one on the left and one not visible on the right. Okay? And bilaterally during cervical flexion, all the facet joints are gonna undergo what's called upsloping. Now what is upsloping? Upsloping is really just where the superior vertebra moves superiorly and anteriorly relative to the vertebra below. In other words, if we consider the C3, C4 segment, for example, out of those two, the, the superior vertebra is C3, the inferior one is C4. So we could say that if C3 upslopes on C4, that means that C3 glides or slides both anteriorly and superiorly relative to C4. We could also say that C4 glides superiorly and anteriorly relative to C5, and, and so on and so forth. And this gliding movement is at the facet joints. Okay? Now I want you to think about that superior movement for a second. Again, there is anterior movement, but conceptually it's easy to consider the superior movement. If the vertebra above is moving superior relative to the vertebra below, what do you think that does to the facet joint? Does that close down the facet joint or does it open up the facet joint? Well, it opens up the facet joint because if the vertebra above is moving superiorly, then there's more space between those articulating surfaces that make up the facet joint. So the facet joint actually gaps a little bit, okay? Another effect that this has is on the intervertebral foramina on each side. Remember those intervertebral foramina are where the nerve roots exit. And so whenever you get that superior movement of the superior vertebra relative to the one below, it actually increases the space of that intervertebral foramen at each level. And so there's more space for the nerve root. And so if somebody has a radiculopathy where they have a compressed nerve root, they may actually like cervical flexion a little bit better than extension, as we'll see in a minute, because in flexion, when you go into that, it gaps the facet joint, 
and it opens up that intervertebral foramen. And so there's more space for the nerve root. So hopefully that makes sense what upsloping is. We're going to see the opposite in cervical extension, which is downsloping at each level. Now, um, we also have these other joints here. We have the atlanooccipital joint, which is the joint between the occiput and the atlas, and the atlanoaxial joint. Okay? Um, flexion still occurs at these levels. Um, you'll notice here at the atlanooccipital joint, um, over here is anterior, back here is posterior, so we still get flexion. And so what's happening is the skull, via the occipital condyles, is rolling anteriorly. Okay? Now, this goes to convex concave rules, so if you haven't learned those, don't worry about this. But because the occipital condyles are convex, and they're moving relative to a concavity on the atlas, which is that superior facet, that means that when the skull via the occipital condyles rolls anteriorly, the occipital condyles are also going to slide the opposite direction. They're going to slide posteriorly. We're going to go into that in a lot more detail in probably the next video or two, um, and we'll talk about those arthrokinematic movements. But just understand that whenever the occiput undergoes flexion on the atlas and we get that anterior roll, there's posterior slide or posterior glide of those occipital condyles on that superior facet of the atlas, and that's really to maintain maximal contact between the occipital condyles and the atlas. Now, at the atlanoaxial joint, we also have flexion. Again, we're going to see that the atlas's posterior tubercle separates from the axis's uh, spinous process. And we talked about that up here. Uh, really, there's more of a pivot here. So we get an anterior pivot of the atlas on the axis. And this has a lot of implications um, in different kinds of spinal cord disorders, which again we will talk about later. But just understand that there's not really so much a roll or a slide here as there is an anterior pivot of the atlas on the axis. We'll be revisiting that in a lot more detail later on. The big thing to understand here for cervical flexion is that bilateral upsloping on both the left and right facet joints. Okay? So the, the superior vertebra moves both superiorly and anteriorly. And the major effects of those are they gap the facet joints. So they go into a more of an open-packed position. And that intervertebral foramen at each level has more space. And that means more space for the nerve roots. Okay? Now, for the range of motion of cervical flexion, the combined is about 40 to 50 degrees. Okay? Um, the lower cervical spine, remember we talked about that being the levels of C2-3 down through about C7-T1, um, that contributes about 35 to 40 degrees of that total range of motion for flexion. Notice that uh, the atlanooccipital joint and the atlanoaxial joints each contribute 5 degrees to that flexion range of motion. Okay? So by a large margin, the lower cervical spine contributes the vast majority of that range of motion. But these two joints, atlanooccipital and atlanoaxial, each contribute five degrees. So that's cervical flexion. Pretty much everything we just talked about is going to be the exact opposite in cervical extension. Okay, So now we imagine bending the head backwards or bending the neck backwards to look up at the ceiling. So this is cervical extension, basically bending the neck backwards. We've got bilateral downsloping in extension, but we'll come back to that in just a minute. Look over here for a second at these vertebra. So again, the posterior tubercle of the atlas and then all of these spinous processes, are they separating? No, they're coming closer together. And we have a term for that. That's actually approximation. So whenever the spinous processes come closer together in any part of the spine, that's referred to as approximation. Now you can imagine what that does to the ligamentum nuchae or nuchal ligament it puts it in laxity, okay? whereas in flexion, when all of those uh, spinous processes separated, it put it in tension. Now the ligamentum nuchae, or nuchal ligament, is in laxity. But that also means now that the anterior longitudinal ligament is now on tension. Okay? And in fact, one of the limiting factors for extension is the tension in that anterior longitudinal ligament, or its, its extensibility, we'll say. But another limiting factor is really just the approximation of the spinous processes. Okay, if these spinous processes start bumping into each other, well, you can't go any further than that. 
And then also notice that the anterior regions of the disc are no longer compressed. Okay? The posterior regions are actually not really that compressed. It's really just that we see that anterior part of the disc compressed during flexion. Now, as I mentioned, we have bilateral downsloping. So you can imagine that downsloping is the exact opposite of upsloping. So the superior vertebra now moves, instead of superiorly and anteriorly, it moves inferiorly and posteriorly relative to the vertebra below. So for example, if we again consider that C3, C4 segment, so during extension of the cervical spine, C3 would move both inferiorly and posteriorly relative to C4. Okay, we could say C5 would move inferiorly and posteriorly relative to C6. Okay, now I want you to consider that inferior movement for just a second. Again, there is posterior, but it's more conceptually sound to think of the inferior movement. So if C3, let's say, is moving inferior relative to C4, C3 is coming closer to C4, right? What do you think that does to the facet joint? Does it put it more in a closed pack position or more open pack position? Well, if the two vertebra are approximating, then the facet joint is going to be more closed packed. In fact, cervical extension is actually the more closed pack position of the cervical spine, whereas flexion is the more open pack position of the cervical spine. So those articulating surfaces of the facet joints are coming closer together. So they are approximating. What does that do to the intervertebral foramina at each level? Well, the intervertebral foramina is going to narrow. Okay? Again, exact opposite of flexion. In flexion, the facet joints are more open packed and the intervertebral foramina are, are wider. Now we have an extension the facet joints are more closed packed and the intervertebral foramina are narrower. What does that do for the space available for the nerve root? Well, there's less space for the nerve root. And so if an individual has a radiculopathy, so a compressed nerve root, they're probably not going to like extension very well because when you go into cervical extension, it narrows that intervertebral foramen at that level and it may contribute to further compression of that nerve root. So hopefully that makes sense. Now a couple other things here. Here's our atlanto-occipital joint. Again, remember that when we go into extension, uh, really the occipital condyle is rolling posteriorly relative to that atlas. And again, this goes back to concave convex rules, which we'll be hitting a lot more in a, in a future video. But when we roll posteriorly about the atlas, there's going to be a little bit of anterior slide. So they're occurring in opposite directions here. Okay. And again, that anterior slide of the occipital condyle on that atlas is to maintain contact as the occipital condyle, or just the skull in general, rolls posteriorly during extension. Okay. Um, also notice that um, when we get this uh, posterior roll, um, that's actually going to put some uh, tension on the atlanto-occipital membrane and the joint capsule, which exists a little bit more anteriorly. Now for the atlanto-axial joint, here we're seeing the pivot and the extension movement occur in the same direction. Okay? So here's the posterior tubercle of the atlas and here's the spinous process of the axis. We already know during cervical extension those two structures are going to approximate, they're going to come closer together. But as the atlas bends backwards relative to the axis in extension, we're going to see the atlas actually pivot posteriorly relative to the axis. Okay. So again, that extension type of movement and pivoting are occurring in the same direction for the lanoaxial joint. That's the same thing we saw in flexion. When we get that flexion anteriorly, we get anterior pivot of the atlas relative to the axis. Okay. And as we pivot the atlas posteriorly relative to the axis, that also puts stress or, or tension, I should say, on the anterior joint capsule of the lanoaxial joint. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense. And then before we conclude the video, let's make sure to talk about the extension range of motion. So combined, it's about 70 to 80 degrees. So notice we have a greater extension range of motion than flexion. Also in the same manner as flexion, the lower cervical spine, so segment C23 and down to C71, those contribute a much greater uh, percentage of that range of motion. So 55 to 60 degrees of the extension range of motion out of the 70 to 80 are contributed via that lower cervical spine. And then the atlanto-occipital joint and atlanto-axial joints each contribute about 10 degrees to that extension range of motion. Okay? One thing to notice is that every single level here 
atlanto-occipital, atlanto-axial, and the lower cervical spine, they all contribute to some extent to flexion and extension. In the next video, when we start looking at rotation and, and lateral flexion, also called side bending, those biomechanics get a little bit more complicated, but you should notice that um, some of these joints don't contribute to particular motions, and that's something we need to keep in mind. So join us in the next video where we talk about cervical lateral flexion and cervical rotation. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.